The Blue Castle Chapter 10 Bless this food to our use and consecrate our lives to thy service, said Uncle Herbert briskly. Aunt Wellington frowned. She always considered Herbert's graces entirely too short and flippant. A grace, to be a grace in Aunt Wellington's eyes, had to be at least three minutes long and uttered in an unearthly tone, between a groan and a chant. As a protest she kept her head bent a perceptible time after all the rest had been lifted. When she permitted herself to sit upright she found Valancy looking at her. Ever afterwards Aunt Wellington averred that she had known from that moment that there was something wrong with Valancy. In those queer, slanted eyes of hers, we should always have known she was not entirely right with eyes like that, there was an odd gleam of mockery and amusement as if Valancy were laughing at her. Such a thing was unthinkable, of course. Aunt Wellington at once ceased to think it. Valancy was enjoying herself. She had never enjoyed herself at a family reunion before. In social function, as in childish games, she had only filled in. Her clan had always considered her very dull. She had no parlor tricks. And she had been in the habit of taking refuge from the boredom of family parties in her blue castle, which resulted in an absent-mindedness that increased her reputation for dullness and vacuity. She has no social presence whatever, and Wellington had decreed once and for all. Nobody dreamed that Valancy was dumb in their presence merely because she was afraid of them. Now she was no longer afraid of them. The shackles had been stricken off her soul. She was quite prepared to talk if occasion offered. Meanwhile she was giving herself such freedom of thought as she had never dared to take before. She let herself go with a wild, inner exultation, as Uncle Herbert carved the turkey. Uncle Herbert gave Valancy a second look that day. Being a man, he didn't know what she had done to her hair, but he thought surprisingly that Doss was not such a bad-looking girl, after all, and he put an extra piece of white meat on her plate. What herb is most injurious to a young lady's beauty, propounded Uncle Benjamin by way of starting conversation, loosening things up a bit, as he would have said. Valancy, whose duty it was to say, what, did not say it. Nobody else said it, so Uncle Benjamin, after an expectant pause, had to answer, time, and felt that his riddle had fallen flat. He looked resentfully at Valancy, who had never failed him before, but Valancy did not seem even to be aware of him. She was gazing around the table, examining relentlessly everyone in this depressing assembly of sensible people and watching their little squirms with a detached, amused smile. So these were the people she had always held in reverence and fear. She seemed to see them with new eyes. Big, capable, patronizing, voluble Aunt Mildred, who thought herself the cleverest woman in the clan, her husband a little lower than the angels and her children wonders. Had not her son, Howard, been all through teething at eleven months? And could she not tell you the best way to do everything, from cooking mushrooms to picking up a snake? What a bore she was. What ugly moles she had on her face. Cousin Gladys, who was always praising her son, who had died young, and always fighting with her living one. She had neuritis, or what she called neuritis. It jumped about from one part of her body to another. It was a convenient thing. If anybody wanted her to go somewhere she didn't want to go she had neuritis in her legs. And always if any mental effort was required she could have neuritis in her head. You can't think with neuritis in your head, my dear. What an old humbug you are, thought Valancy impiously. Aunt Isabel. Valancy counted her chins. Aunt Isabel was the critic of the clan. She had always gone about squashing people flat. More members of it than Valancy were afraid of her. She had, it was conceded, a biting tongue. I wonder what would happen to your face if you ever smiled, speculated Valancy, unblushingly. Second cousin Sarah Taylor, with her great, pale, expressionless eyes, who was noted for the variety of her pickle recipes and for nothing else. So afraid of saying something indiscreet that she never said anything worth listening to. So proper that she blushed when she saw the advertisement picture of a corset and had put a dress on her Venus de Milo statuette which made it look real tasty. Little cousin Georgiana. Not such a bad little soul. But dreary very. Always looking as if she had just been starched and ironed always afraid to let herself go. The only thing she really enjoyed was a funeral. You knew where you were with a corpse. 
nothing more could happen to it. But while there was life there was fear. Uncle James. Handsome, black, with his sarcastic, trap-like mouth and iron-gray sideburns, whose favorite amusement was to write controversial letters to the Christian times, attacking modernism. Valency always wondered if he looked as solemn when he was asleep as he did when awake. No wonder his wife had died young. Valency remembered her. A pretty, sensitive thing. Uncle James had denied her everything she wanted and showered on her everything she didn't want. He had killed her, quite legally. She had been smothered and starved. Uncle Benjamin, wheezy, pussy-mouthed. With great pouches under eyes that held nothing in reverence. Uncle Wellington. Long, pallid face, thin, pale yellow hair, one of the fair sterlings, thin, stooping body, abominably high forehead with such ugly wrinkles, and eyes about as intelligent as a fish's, thought Valency. Looks like a cartoon of himself. Aunt Wellington. Named Mary but called by her husband's name to distinguish her from Great Aunt Mary. A massive, dignified, permanent lady. Splendidly arranged, iron-gray hair. Rich, fashionable, beaded dress. Had her moles removed by electrolysis, which Aunt Mildred thought was a wicked evasion of the purposes of God. Uncle Herbert, with his spiky gray hair. Aunt Alberta, who twisted her mouth so unpleasantly in talking and had a great reputation for unselfishness because she was always giving up a lot of things she didn't want. Valency let them off easily in her judgment because she liked them, even if they were in Milton's expressive phrase, stupidly good. But she wondered for what inscrutable reason Aunt Alberta had seen fit to tie a black velvet ribbon around each of her chubby arms above the elbow. Then she looked across the table at Olive. Olive, who had been held up to her as a paragon of beauty, behavior and success as long as she could remember. Why can't you hold yourself like Olive, Doss? Why can't you stand correctly like Olive, Doss? Why can't you speak prettily like Olive, Doss? Why can't you make an effort, Doss? Valencia's self and eyes lost their mocking glitter and became pensive and sorrowful. You could not ignore or disdain Olive. It was quite impossible to deny that she was beautiful and effective and sometimes she was a little intelligent. Her mouth might be a trifle heavy, she might show her fine, white, regular teeth rather too lavishly when she smiled. But when all was said and done, Olive justified Uncle Benjamin summing up a stunning girl. Yes, Valency agreed in her heart, Olive was stunning. Rich, golden-brown hair, elaborately dressed, with a sparkling bandeau holding its glossy puffs in place, large, brilliant blue eyes and thick silken lashes, face of rose and bare neck of snow, rising above her gown, great pearl bubbles in her ears, the blue-white diamond flame on her long, smooth, waxen finger with its rosy, pointed nail. Arms of marble, gleaming through green chiffon and shadow lace. Valency felt suddenly thankful that her own scrawny arms were decently swathed in brown silk. Then she resumed her tabulation of Olive's charms. Tall. Queenly. Confident. Everything that Valency was not. Dimples, too, in cheeks and chin. A woman with dimples always gets her own way, thought Valency, in a recurring spasm of bitterness at the fate which had denied her even one dimple. Olive was only a year younger than Valency, though a stranger would have thought that there was at least ten years between them but nobody ever dreaded old maidenhood for her. Olive had been surrounded by a crowd of eager bows since her early teens, just as her mirror was always surrounded by a fringe of cards, photographs, programs and invitations. At 18, when she had graduated from Havergal College, Olive had been engaged to Will Desmond, lawyer in embryo. Will Desmond had died and Olive had mourned for him properly for two years. When she was 23 she had a hectic affair with Donald Jackson. But aunt and uncle Wellington disapproved of that and in the end Olive dutifully gave him up. Nobody in the Sterling clan, whatever outsiders might say, hinted that she did so because Donald himself was cooling off. However that might be, Olive's third venture met with everybody's approval. Cecil Price was clever and handsome and one of the Port Lawrence Prices. Olive had been engaged to him for three years. He had just graduated in civil engineering and they were to be married as soon as he landed a contract. Olive's hope chest was full to overflowing with exquisite things and Olive had already confided to Valency what her wedding dress was to be. 
Ivory silk draped with lace, white satin court train, lined with pale green georgette, heirloom veil of Brussels lace. Valency knew also, though Olive had not told her, that the bridesmaids were selected and that she was not among them. Valency had, after a fashion, always been Olive's confidant, perhaps because she was the only girl in the connection who could not bore Olive with return confidences. Olive always told Valency all the details of her love affairs, from the days when the little boys in school used to persecute her with love letters. Valency could not comfort herself by thinking these affairs mythical. Olive really had them. Many men had gone mad over her besides the three fortunate ones. I don't know what the poor idiots see in me that drives them to make such double idiots of themselves, Olive was wont to say. Valency would have liked to say, I don't either, but truth and diplomacy both restrained her. She did know, perfectly well. Olive Sterling was one of the girls about whom men do go mad just as indubitably as she, Valency, was one of the girls at whom no man ever looked twice. And yet, thought Valency, summing her up with a new and merciless conclusiveness, she's like a duelist morning. There's something lacking.